Good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a great privilege uh, for me to come out here today, and uh, I'm very uh, honoured to be associated over a, pretty well most of my adult life with uh, Paul. Uh, going back to the 1970s when he worked in the steel industry and was a delegate, and uh, then the issue was the incredible crisis that we had with 25,000 workers losing their job in a period of months in the early 80s. And how do we, so how do we actually build a strong economy? That was the one issue that I think Paul focused on as a leader on. In the 80s, when he was a leader of the Labor Council, there were huge issues about uh, superannuation, workers' compensation issues. So I was always focused on trying to protect people here and their, uh, their rights and also their living standards. Uh, more recently, I've been, I have been involved with Paul because of the extraordinary corruption in Wollongong Council over the last few years, and we had a group called Wollongong Against Corruption. If you want to know where resources, why things don't get done, it's a terrific case study about why we have got even fundamental local infrastructure built here. Because the agendas were set elsewhere, and the priorities were elsewhere, mainly about the greed, and we know explicitly corruption of both councillors and of senior staff and in council. And finally, I haven't been involved in this victims of financial fraud, but what an extraordinary uh, campaign that those of them you were involved. And uh, I'm very proud to be in the see calls role in that, but the others of you as well, in terms of saying that people are losing their life savings because of these plunders that are taking place in Australia at the moment. So that's why I want to say I strongly support Paul. And I'll add a final footnote. I do know Bong Bong Road. I, I worked here with the last progressive uh, member of the Labor Party, uh, Colin Hollis, uh, for a period uh, in the early mid-1980s because Colin was passionate about doing something about building a very strong port, about saving the steel industry, about the coal industry, and about giving quality of life and education for residents. So I took the lead for my job to work with Colin. But I have to say, since that period, you know, coming back here today, what has actually fundamentally changed? Well, not much, except people's lives are much tougher in the main in Wollongong. So when we come to Horsley, it's a, it is a very important case study about why things don't happen when they should happen. There's 7,000 residents in Horsley, and they didn't come here yesterday. It has now, it's now, I have to say, it's a developed suburb of Wollongong. And there's a massive skew in the infrastructure and the services that apply here. I just have a look at the data before I came here today. Now, 4% of the people who work in Horsley actually get to work by public transport. I don't know where they walk to, to, to the station or where you get that foot. But that is one of the lowest I have ever seen in any area of a city in Australia. 4% in use public transport. I mean, just to compare, 75% of people living around the city of Sydney go by public transport. 35% of people living in Parramatta in Western Sydney get to work by public transport. In Horsley, 4%. So that means that you either have complete contempt for public transport, or much more likely, the services are just not here and are committed to. So people have to go by road. And another extraordinary, you must be one of the wealthiest areas I've ever come across, because 75% of households have two or more cars. 50% have two cars, 25% have three cars. Now that means you are either incredibly wealthy, congratulations, I probably don't need to be here if that's the case, or you've got no alternative. You've got no alternative. So what we have, enlightened government now over 30, 40 years as they roll out those new Greenfields developments, when we know about congestion, when we know about environmental damage, they make these areas more car dependent than ever. So this is why I think it's fundamentally important that we focus on one of the real issues here today, is that why do the new areas such as these not get their fair share in terms of infrastructure and so on. And I want to briefly just very, uh, you cut me down any time you want or we'll discuss it, I briefly want to talk about three things and Paul's touched on some. One is a lack of resources to make things happen or the poor coordination of resources to make things happen. The second is how do we approach infrastructure planning in, in cities in, in particular so that things don't happen in suburbs but they happen in, in some other areas with completely mad mega projects that don't make sense. 
And the third thing, I think it was Paul alluded to, is around governance and community. The first thing I think why we need a stronger voice in Canberra is because the resources have disappeared into the ether. The resources that should be available to support community infrastructure, to support improvements in living standards, have disappeared. I'll give you an example. The resource rental tax, I'm looking at the Treasury figures, said that by 2013-2014, there'd be $9 billion in the Federal Treasury that would have been extracted at last from those huge mining companies, particularly BHP, Billiton, uh, particularly uh, RTZ, Extra, and others, that would be available to support infrastructure, to support the Australia, to support medical and educational resources. Now, the first uh, six months of the now what they call the mineral resource rental tax raised $126 million. They had budgeted that for that first six months it would raise $2 billion, but because of the pressure of the mining companies on those groups, the money had just disappeared into the ether. So the money that should be there to support infrastructure is not occurring. So then you, then you get the, the type of commitments that have been made, tax concessions to uh, major companies, tax concessions to people who are very well off, the superannuation concessions to, to high income earners. So in other words, the total pool of resources to support infrastructure has been reduced over time, not increased. So that's at the federal level. At the state level, we had a long uh, uh, campaign down here, and an unsuccessful one, to try and save the port. The port's just been privatised in the last couple of weeks. But the state government says when we privatise it, we will earmark $100 million for you and it will come back to Wollongong and you can spend it on your infrastructure priorities. Well, here was a chance for the local government, for the state members, to put forward a plan to say, well, we've got to fix up this infrastructure imbalances that we had. But what happened when they sold it? Of course, the first commitment was we're going to extend the Princess Highway down past Payama to make that work. So in other words, the big mega project to get people down the south coast faster from Sydney from their, to their holiday homes or whatever was put in place. But we haven't been able to address the fundamental issues about giving residents access, mobility to work, to education, to hospitals and so on that should be the right uh, of, of every Australian. So that's the first thing. The second thing is about the infrastructure priorities itself, and I think that's particularly a good example, Paul, about talking about Morton Dumbarton. I've been involved in this Morton Dumbarton fiasco since 1983. There have been four rounds of consulting reports, each costing about $400,000, and each one finally saying, look, it's not feasible, maybe in the future, but state and federal governments commit to the project that is valued at around about $900 million to build a project that's not monitored. Now imagine if we made the case to take 10% of that for the suburbs of southern Wollongong, not just Horsley but other areas in uh, the growing areas of Dapto and so on, to say we want to align where population growth occurs and where there's a backlog in infrastructure with our funding commitment to make sure these things are actually putting priority projects are put in place. So I'm not asking for a more than a to come down here. We're asking for a small share of resources that could exist, that could be committed to make community infrastructure work rather than these big mega projects. Now one thing I do have trouble understanding is why make these big mega projects are put right up the top and our services to communities keep deteriorating. So there is an issue, there's a political issue but there's also, and I think the point was made before, that there needs to be stronger coordination between what the federal government does, what the state government does, and what the local government does.